everything that pertains to life and godliness through His Spirit. This is the most radical, courageous call of all. And it's do you dare bear the life of Christ in your life. Have you ever wondered if you're the only one that struggles with your finances? Have you been looking for resources that would help you get your finances in order? Are you needing help knowing what kind of estate planning you should have in place? If you've asked any of these questions, you'll want to be a part of our upcoming financial fitness seminar on Saturday, February 16th, beginning at 8.30 in the morning, right here at Capital Christian Center. And it'll be a great day for us to be together with four of the finest financial planners and asset managers in the Sacramento region. We need your help in getting ready for the seminar. If you would complete a registration card and give it to an usher or put it in the offering, or you could register online. This is going to be a real enjoyable day. I hope you're able to make it. Make room in your schedule because it will be worthwhile. I look forward to seeing you there. This theme for the month of February is the gift of love in our ultimate gift series through 2008. Last week, we planted a tree (laughs) to um, be a part of our display for the month with our family tree. And so in case you weren't here last week and wondered, what what in the world are they doing with it? You know, that doesn't even make sense. Well, (laughs) if you come here all month, it'll make sense. So... Yeah. We're talking about how love grows and how we pass it on in our family tree to those that we love. And uh, this is a great month and a great week for us to look for ways to love people. I know. Even you think about how your family tree doesn't just affect you. It affects every single one that you touch, who you are. Who you are goes out and spreads love. That's our intention is that we intentionally spread love. You know, this month, this week is Valentine's week. And you may be out there sitting thinking, well, I wonder what my husband's going to do for me, or what is my wife going to do for me, or what are my kids going to do for me, or what is someone else going to do for me? And I want to encourage you this morning, think about what can I do for someone else? Get outside of your box of you, because it's never a good place. Us place is not a good place. A giving place is a great place to live. And so this morning, think about where can you encourage someone else? Where can you send a love note to someone else? Just encourage them. Um, We're going to have a great opportunity this morning to hear a ministry that is starting here. It's already started across the country, and it is to young women. And, you know, these women haven't had many people encourage them in the Lord. It's been quite the opposite. People have robbed from their lives. And we want to encourage you this morning, look for someone like that and make it a point this week. Instead of robbing, I'm going to give. We met Nancy Alcorn just a couple summers ago on a great Sacramento summer day. It was about 110 degrees. We were outside dedicating the property that's now where the Mercy Ministry house is being built in the sweltering heat. It was a wonderful day, wasn't it, Nancy? We welcomed you to our city on the perfect day. And uh, we were just so impressed with what's happening through Mercy Ministries. And there are homes all around this country and other nations through what Nancy does. You're going to hear it from her. And so just to introduce her, there's a video just about four minutes long. It'll help you get introduced to what you're going to hear about. When that's over, Nancy's going to come, so make sure you give her a great welcome at that time and let her know that we, we love her and glad that she's here to talk to us today.
remember walking and sitting on my knees and looking up and completely questioning whether life was worth it. I was made for a purpose, but I didn't care. I didn't see any hope. So my life before Mercy was pretty much trying to die. Well, when I was 12 years old, I was manipulated and groomed into a sexual relationship with a drug dealer who was about 10 years older than I was. All I could hear was negative voices telling me how ugly I was. I tried to kill myself three times and couldn't even achieve that. It was eight years of a lot of frustration working in, in government programs that looked good and sounded good on paper, but the reality was that the lives weren't changing. I got to see God's love for me through this staff here, through some residents, so that softened my heart a lot. And I can't believe how much softer I am now, how much more I smile or care about people. The Lord spoke three things to me. Take the girls in free of charge because they need to know they can trust. You're not trying to make money off their problem. Secondly, give at least 10% of everything that comes into other ministries. And the third thing was not to take any state or federal funding or any money with strings on it because it was to be a Christ-centered program. And um, I didn't believe them when they told me it was free of charge because, sorry, um, because I'd been turned away so many times and I just wanted help. I couldn't be left alone. I had to be supervised 24-7. So short of putting me in a psych ward, that was basically all the mental health system could do, unfortunately. I thought that I'd always live in fear and pain. And now God has given me my life back. When doctors tell you that the only way to be happy is 10 pills a day, and then God proves them different, that's a miracle. And every day is new for me. Every day is an adventure. And that's all thanks to Mercy Ministries. I couldn't imagine um, ever being this excited to live, like the girls said, to live and, and looking forward to future and my life. So thank you, Nancy. <laughs> we figure these problems exist all around the world, and why not just take this model and reproduce it in other countries? We have several homes in America, Peru, the United Kingdom, Australia. New Zealand and other countries still coming on board and we're just excited that now we're going to the nations. The thing that Mark and I love about the work of Mercy Ministries is that it really approaches every girl firstly as an individual, it doesn't try to institutionalize their problem, but to see them healed on an emotional side, a physical side and a spiritual side. You know lots of places are good at putting band-aids on but bottom line is you've got to get to the root of the problem. And so we support Mercy Ministries because we really believe in the work of God to heal and to restore a person's life. You know what we found out? It doesn't matter what the problem is. Jesus Christ is the answer. So I want to get results and I want to, I want to do it with my whole heart. And uh, that's why I still do it because... I see lives changing and, and the results are there. And every time a girl graduates from this program, I feel like we won the Super Bowl. It's awesome. We gotta do it together. Yes, right? together. We gotta do it together, together girl. That's it. <laughs> we will no longer settle for cheap substitutes to try to satisfy that void in our life. When I came to Mercy, it gave me the practical help that I needed to be free to be who I was without being afraid or being ashamed. That's when I found freedom. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here with pastors Rick and Kathy Cole and to be a part of this great church here this morning. And any time a pastor honors particularly a woman with their pulpit, it's special, right girls? So hey, I don't take it lightly and I'm really thankful. And you know, I wanted you to see a little glimpse of what we're going to be doing, which is why I wanted to show that DVD, because we're going to be doing it right here in your city. And that home is going up right now. We're just so excited about it. But the, the cool thing is, you know, we've been having to fly California girls and girls from the West Coast all the way to either Nashville or St. Louis or Louisiana. And we're not going to have to do that anymore because we're going to have a place right here where girls can come and get the help they need. And it's just so beautiful. And uh, I've been told 
this morning and I got to hug a few of them that in this service, we had several girls in the earlier service, but we have seven former, uh, th- that I know of right now, maybe more, but we have se- seven former mercy residents in this service this morning, right here from your area. Isn't that great? And, um, I wanted to tell you girls to please come up afterwards so I can give you a hug and we can connect with you. Cause I, so unless you have to be at work and you're going to get in trouble with your boss, stay. And so we can catch up. Okay. Um, I am, uh, just very quickly, I want to introduce, um, someone who's with me because she's actually, actually been serving as our development director for this area. And she's in and out of here all the time. But Selah Hirsch and her husband, Michael, worked at the L.A. Dream Center for two, year, two or three years with Pastor Tommy and Matthew Barnett. And, and then uh, they're also both graduates of Oral Roberts University. And they came back to St. Louis to work with Joyce Meyer and the Dream Center there. And uh, Joyce is one of our Mercy supporters. And Selah came to me and was like, God's put mercy on my heart. And I really think I'm supposed to be working for you guys. And I said, I'm not touching that one. You're going to have to go. Talk to Joyce about that, not because I, you know, I don't steal other people's staff, but I do want to, you know, do what the will of God. And so she went and shared her heart with, with uh, her supervisor and said, you know, my heart's really there. So Joyce called me and she said, we're going to release Selah to you. She said, the way I look at it, why would we want to keep her if her heart's with you? So <laughs> Joyce, only Joyce can say things that way, you know. So, but. Really and truly, Joyce Meyer has been one of our strongest mercy supporters because she was sexually abused as a little girl. Many of you know her story. And uh, she started supporting us. And at the present time, her ministry gives our ministry $35,000 every month to help us do what we do. And you, it may sound like a lot, but listen, when, you are, when you're taking care of young girls who have to pay $1,500 to $2,000 a day to go to a similar secular program, and we're taking them in free of charge, it takes a lot of money. But you know what? We are committed to take the girls in free of charge. And God spoke to me years ago, if you'll take the girls in free of charge, if you will be committed to give at least 10% of what comes into your ministry to other ministries and offerings when I tell you, then I'll make sure that I set up divine connections for you and that your needs will be met through your giving. And we've been faithful to do that. So when the devil tries to whisper in my ear, you can't afford to give, I'm not, no, we can't afford not to. That doesn't work with me anymore because 25 years of miracles and divine appointments, I'm just not, that's not even a temptation. But yes. And I want to tell you about one divine appointment that God set up for me that's connected to your city. Um, A couple of years ago, uh, maybe three years ago, actually, I was just doing what I do. And, you know, the Lord says that if we'll just go on about our business and trust in him with all of our heart, lean not to our own understanding, but just acknowledge him in all of our ways, he'll direct our path. And I got a phone call from um, a family that, and, and it turned out to be Buzz Oates. And many of you know he's a commercial real estate developer here in town. And he just had it. He loves the Lord. And he had it in his heart for years and years that he wanted to help finance a Christian-based home where girls that had, had issues and needed help could come and get the help they needed. And so he has donated a piece of land to us in Lincoln, which you just saw at the 110-degree groundbreaking that we had. And... Uh, he has also given us, uh, we're, we're building a 22,000 square foot, 40 bed facility with office space there to house our staff. And it's under construction right now in Lincoln and he's given us 2.5 of the necessary money needed to build that. So we're very excited. I believe in giving honor to whom honors do. He probably wouldn't even like it if he knew I was telling you guys, but he's a wonderful man and he's going to leave quite a legacy because of his giving. And we want to leave a legacy, Mercy Ministries. We want people to, to say about us that we're leaving a legacy of love. And I know that you guys have been focusing about love in your church. And, you know, it's one thing to tell people all the things they've done wrong. But it's another when somebody falls down and made a mistake to reach down and pick them up and help pull them out with the love of Christ. And Sayla and Michael were involved in doing that with the Dream Center in L.A. and then the Dream Center in St. Louis and now helping us. And so I want you... Uh, guys to meet Selah. Why don't you come up here and help me give away a few things? This is Selah. And uh, 
if you want to get involved with us in some way, then you can either go through your pastors here and they'll pass on or uh, the names or whatever. Or you can talk with her. But um, we, the book that I wanted you to get is called Echoes of Mercy. That's my first book. And it's the one that really just puts the vision on the inside of you and stirs you and moves you with compassion and great stories and testimonies in there. But uh, we sold out of that the last service. So We'll, we're going to make sure we get it to the bookstore so that you can get it. But it's called Echoes of Mercy, and maybe they'll they'll highlight it because that's the one that I want you to read. And and you're going to need it comes with a box of tissue, but it's going to stir your heart to love people like you've never dreamed possible before. And today, when you leave, we're going to give you a magazine that has girls' testimonies in it, and you'll have all of our contact details, website, and everything. And we we want you guys to pray for us because you know what? We're stepping out in faith. God said. Uh, build it and and he'll provide the way and the way is provided through people helping so y'all pray for us help us you know in whatever way you feel led but uh, go on our website and read some of the powerful testimonies but I want to give some of this stuff away real quick we have another book that's that's that was really powerful too it's called Mercy Moves Mountains and it's a book of testimonies of different girls with different issues all who have been set free uh, through the power and the love of Jesus Christ and his forgiveness and so we want to give that away. If you want that, raise your hand. We also deal with, as you saw on the screen, we deal with some pretty serious issues, eating disorders, cutting. And we just recently uh, decided to do a series dealing with issue-related things. And it helps people who don't come to Mercy to learn how to get set free from these issues. And you say, well, I don't cut and I don't have an eating disorder, so I don't need that book. Let me t- shame on you for saying that because you need to learn how to minister to people that have those issues so that you can get them pl- set free and get them planted in the church of God and, 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 and make them a part of this local church. And so anyway, so we're on a mission. The church is about going out in the world and catching fish. And my favorite place to go fishing is in the garbage can of, the, of society. It's really big co- garbage can of, of secular society because they label people rejects, castaways, and throwaways. And they put them in this big garbage can and they say, no hope. No way out, no future, and we go fishing in there because of partners. We, our partners pay for our fishing trips, and we go over there, and we cast the net, and we pull out those girls, man, and they're all messed up, and we just sh- give Jesus to them and love them where they are, and you just see the power of Christ. Jesus comes in their heart. They get the word in their heart, and their mind gets renewed, and they start changing and, and just getting set free from all kinds of things, and it's exciting. It's exciting. It's so exciting. And um, so we are, we're seeing that. And this girl had a big cutting problem. She's from a West Coast girl, the girl on the front of this cover. These are actual girls in our program. And we use this picture, of course, with permission. But she had been in the program one week. And if the cutters, they always wear the long sleeves because they're ashamed and they don't want people to know what they're doing. And, and a lot of people don't understand that. But the inward pain is so great that they they, it, when they cut, it gives a, a temporary release and distraction from that inside pain. And so if we want to get that inside pain healed. And Jesus came to heal broken hearts. So we need to get involved with what he came to do. And so in this book, this book, this girl, she had been there a week. And we had a prophetic minister there that day speaking to our girls. And so this prophetic minister, just she called... Uh, she called Rachel up and she just said, I feel led of the Lord to pray for you. And she began to minister to her. And just immediately she said, God is telling me to tell you, I hear God saying that to tell you that you are not forgotten. I have not forgotten you. I have not forgotten you. Well, that girl just started weeping and crying. And after it was, after that session was over, she came up and she rolled her sleeve up and showed us that the, she had carved the word forgotten on her arm with the scars very prominent. Go check it out on the resource table after the service. It's pretty cool. And she is on fire for God in a local church, just doing amazing. And so, I, Selah, why don't you go ahead and give those to someone? And then uh, we put on CD, uh, four CDs, Keys to Walking and Living in Freedom. And these are the principles of freedom on CD that we use to get the girls set free. If you can only get one, there's a bunch of CDs and out there teaching tapes, but if you can only get one, I would recommend getting this one, Keys to Walking and Living in Freedom, because it, it, it just covers pretty much the whole gamut of things. And anyone that applies what's on these CDs to their life, you're going to experience freedom, I promise you. 
And then this last one I want to mention, it's the Bible on CD, the New Testament on CD and the female voice. Thomas Nelson came to me and wanted to do this as a fundraiser for mercy. And they said, we've researched and no one has ever put the Bible on CD in the female voice. So we're going to do it. And we want to give 10% of the proceeds to mercy. And so they put high profile women from all walks of life reading the Bible. And at the beginning of each book, they have a Mercy Ministries girl telling how Christ transformed her life. So women, you're busy out there, but you know what? The devil tries to keep us out of the word, so we need to get creative and find ways that we can get the word of God inside of us while we're driving our kids somewhere, while we're going to pick something up, while we're cleaning our house. It's amazing how painless it is to do those things we hate to do when we're using that time to put something in us that will be life-changing. So we need to constantly... Keep our minds renewed to the Word of God. Give that away to somebody. Man shall not live by the Word of God, by, the, by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen? Okay, quickly in the next 20 minutes or so, I just want to share with you um, a little bit about the background so that you can kind of connect with this vision But the first eight years of my career life, I spent in in government work right out of college. I took a job, thought I was going to be a basketball coach. I'm a big sports enthusiast. And I I thought I was going to be a basketball coach, but I also took criminal justice and psychology. So the first uh, job out of the chute, right out green behind the ears, was in a girl's correctional facility in Tennessee, a, pr- the, the, a prison for teenage girls ages 14 to 18. They were too young to go to the women's prison, so they came to this one place, and there were 300 girls there at any one period of time. And my job was to coach all the sports teams, do the intramurals, you know, have the, some kind of recreation every day. Even the girls that got put in solitary confinement they have to get at, be taken out one hour a day and have some type of activity. So I would have FaceTime one-on-one with those girls. So God had me strategically placed. And, you know, you spend a year of your life with, a, with anyone, and, and you, care, you learn to care about them. You learn to love them. And um, so I got really close to a lot of those girls, and it was amazing how my heart started being changed from... I still love sports to this day, but my heart started going a different direction. I felt, began to experience a passion more for these girls. Somebody's got to help them because what happened is during the five years I was there, we would run psychological tests on them and tell them all the things that were wrong with them. Separation of church and state. You can't share Jesus Christ. That's what I was told. And they would make us, they wouldn't let us send them to the local church, but they'd make us send them to the psychiatric facilities. And I knew some of the people that worked there and they were more messed up than the kids we were sending to them. And it was just frustrating. And the chaplain in that facility, he had several degrees, several degrees from seminary. And he was getting paid a big salary to take care of the spiritual well-being of those young girls in that facility. And I was told, you know, he takes care of that. But I was vocal about my faith. And, I, you know, when you live Christ, he's coming out of you and you have opportunities to share and so the girls used to go to the chaplain. They would tell me this. They'd go to the chaplain and say, I want to get saved. And he'd go, well, I don't really know exactly what you mean by that, but I think Nancy Alcorn over at the gym knows something about that. Why don't you go talk to her? And it turns out that this guy who had all the degrees from seminary, several of them, was later on it came out that he was sexually uh, molesting some of the girls that were in that program and addicted to pornography and all that. No wonder he didn't know how to tell them because he had never experienced it himself. You know, the natural man and the natural mind cannot comprehend the things of God. They have to be spiritually discerned. But when we receive Jesus, the Spirit of God comes and then we're filled with the Spirit and God begins to open our eyes and illuminate things to us. And at least he would refer them to me. But it was just a crazy place. I mean, it was secular. It was, you know, all the programs that looked good and sounded good on paper, millions of taxpayer dollars being spent. But the reality of it was the lives were not changing. And so during that period of time, five years, girls that were involved in, in prostitution, they go back to the same environment they came out of. The pimps were waiting on them. You know, government specializes in changing behavior. So do psychologists. It's called behavior modification. But Jesus Christ 
changes hearts. He puts a new heart and a new spirit in us. He forgives sin. He heals our broken hearts. And so girls that were involved in gangs, the gang members were waiting. Girls that were addicted to drugs, the drug dealers were waiting to get them entangled back again in the same mess. And we begin to hear of girls dying from drug overdoses, girls getting killed in street gang fights. Many of them past the age of 18. I did a, uh, when I was working on my master's degree, I did an internship in the women's prison in Nashville years later, and I ran into a bunch of those young girls that I had known as juvenile delinquents, and now they've grown up and they're in the women's prison. And I saw the vicious cycle. And I knew that in Christ, the curse is broken. And when we receive Jesus Christ, we're born again and we receive a new bloodline. And we actually have the power to choose. The Lord says, this day I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you and your seed may live. And when you go to secular places that do not acknowledge God, they teach you what a victim you are. And that you can never come out of it. And this happened to you and there's nothing you could do about it. And you have this disease There's nothing you can do about it. And I don't know about you guys, but when I used to mess around with alcohol and drugs and stuff, I didn't consider it a disease. I considered it a choice because I was choosing to do it. And when the power of sin is broken out of our lives, we can choose not to do it. So we we are getting these girls in here, and we have to flush out all the stuff that's been put in them that are just lies. And that's part of what we do at Mercy. We tell them the curse is broken in Christ. We tell them that... that, um, you know, we, that the word of God, you need to renew your mind. You need to play, replace the lies with the truth of what God says about you. And then we tell them that soul, spirit hurts. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And then where there's areas, we deal with areas of demonic oppression. If there's demonic activity, like if somebody's opened themselves up to a spirit of lust through pornography or through lots of promiscuous sexual activity or something like that, then we've opened the door for demonic powers. And, and secular psychiatrists want to medicate things like that. But Jesus did not say to medicate a demon. He said to cast them out. And that's supposed to be a part of normal Christianity. So if, if, if that sounds weird to you, check out Mark 16. It's what I call a believer's job description. And when we ask Jesus into our heart, We signed up for the job, and no good employer would hire you and sign you up to do a job without giving you a job description. We not only get the job description, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, but the Lord even promises not only, you know, well, well, not only do I want you to go, but you need to know that when you go, I'm going with you. And as you speak my word, I will... Cause, I will watch over your words to perform it because you're speaking for me. I will watch over the words to perform it and, and, and I will cause the words you speak to be followed with signs and wonders. There's no greater sign and wonder in my mind than a changed life. And as much as I love sports and as much as I loved it when, oh, Eli Manning, because I, I was tired of the Patriots winning, you understand. So if anybody loves the Patriots, Sorry. I was just tired of that because I'm just, I'm tired of them. And I don't like cheaters anyway. So, so, um, so when O Eli pulled the Houdini and escaped from that defense and managed to sling that ball down the field and David Tyree does this catch on the back of his helmet, how in the world did that guy hang on to that ball? I don't know. But you know what? I would say they were the heroes of the Super Bowl and that play was pretty awesome. But you know what? I used to think that was just the coolest thing. Whoever, you know, hits the, my team, uh, men's team is Vanderbilt, and they got a, 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 a shot right with one second left on the clock to win by one point yesterday. So I'm like, whoa, those people used to be my heroes, you know, the one that throws the touchdown pass or hits the shot at the end of the game, but not anymore. Let me tell you, after 25 years of working at Mercy, I have some new heroes in my life, and seven of them are in the service at least this morning. Those are those girls that know they're messed up, and they're willing to come in and admit that they have issues in their life, and they're willing to deal with those issues so that they can be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. And they, and they come in, and they, they deal with it, and it's painful, and it's tough. And it's a process because once you receive Jesus, that's just the beginning. Then our minds have to be renewed. Our hearts have to be healed. And, and we even when they leave mercy, we're like the next step is life is going to hit you right in the face. 
but you've been equipped now, and you know how to, you don't have to have us, you know, take authority over them anymore. We teach them to take authority over the enemy. Luke 10, 19, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And we, and they, and we let them for a while, you know, come and like, oh, I'm having a nightmare, pray for me. But after they've been in the home a, a, a month or two, and they, there, there comes a the point where we go, you know what? It's time for you to pray for yourself. You pray, and I'm going to agree with you. You need to speak it out of your own mouth. Devil, this is my house, and you're not going to torment me anymore. You no longer have any right to me. I've been bought and paid for with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so that's everyday life at Mercy Ministries, and it's supposed to be everyday Christianity. And I realize you don't just walk up on the street and cast the devil out of somebody because you know what? Some people tried that in the Bible and that didn't work out so well for them. But you know, when a girl is saying, I commit my life to the Lord, I surrender my heart, I repent and I want to go in a different direction. When she gives her life to the Lord, then she has the legal right to command the enemy to get out of her life. I'm not going to serve you anymore. I've got a new master and his name is Jesus Christ. And so we teach the girls that stuff. And uh, so anyway, after five years of in this girl's prison, then I transferred to Department of Human Services, and I spent the last three years of my career life investigating child abuse cases in the inner city of Nashville, Tennessee, would go out with the police all hours of the night. And you know what happened? God took me, and I, I saw little four- and five-year-olds that were being sexually molested, physically abused. One little, uh, some of the kids actually died from physical abuse abandonment issues, mothers that were prostitutes and drug addicts and just leave their kids alone at night like kids under three or four years old sometimes, several of them. And it was just a horrendous thing. And the Lord said, you know, I've just, you just spent five years dealing with angry teenagers who have been hurt and wounded and not cared for and not given the love and security that they need in their life and nurture. And now I'm taking you through back in time, and I'm showing you why they grew up to be angry teenagers. These are the kinds of things that they came out of. And you know what? It put compassion in my heart. When I was working in that girls' facility, God started teaching me about the judgment that was in my own heart as a Christian. There were some cute little sweet little girls that just, you know, had been a little promiscuous, and it wasn't that hard to love them. Maybe they got caught up with a bad boyfriend, and they robbed a grocery store or something, you know, and you just, they're, lo- they're so cute and everything. And then there's those girls that maybe aren't as physically attractive or desirable, who maybe they've been sexually molested by a bunch of folks, and they end up turning to girls because they have been wounded so much by guys. And then somebody like me is going to come along and point a finger or else judge them at my heart and like, whoa, that's weird. Remember when, in the story of the Good Samaritan when the guy was beaten and thrown in the ditch and left to die and there were two religious people of that day that came right by him and never stopped to help. Never did. You know what the Bible says they did? It says, and they just passed by on the other side. And there was something in me at that point that wanted to Pass by on the other side. And what the Lord dealt with me about is if you ever want to be effective for the kingdom of God and you really care about hurting people, then you've got to quit judging them and and you've got to open your heart and let me deliver you from that judgment. And the way that that's going to happen is you have to understand that there is a why behind the what. This girl didn't just grow up one day. You don't just become a, a... a little girl in the earth and decide one day, I think I want to be a lesbian when I grow up, or I think I want to be a prostitute when I grow up, or I think I just want to cut myself. That's cool. No, there is reasons why these young girls have had the things happen. And what God spoke to me, he said, if you had been born into the same situation that you're judging and had the same experiences in your life, then that would be you. And, and, and I mean, I remember it just cut me to the heart kind of like, when the woman was caught in adultery and Jesus said, you without sin, cast the first stone. That's how it hit me. And I was just like, oh. And I remember just crying because I wanted, you know, like I really wanted to help them. But 
I had this thing that was rising up called judgment in me. And the Lord said, a sinner recognizes when you're offended by their sin. And if you want to be the real deal, then you've got to confess to me that the judgment is there. And you've got to allow me to break your heart with what breaks my heart. And begin to pray that I will help you to see people the way I see them. And God started having me go read the case records of the girls and all the stuff they had been through. And it just totally, it just totally brought a humility to me and a, a compassion and I read in the Bible where the Lord says that, that, that Jesus was moved. The scripture says that Jesus was moved with compassion. And I started experience being moved with compassion. And one of the things that helped me do that was I began to put myself in their place. How would I want to be treated if I was in their place? How would I want to be treated? And it just changed everything. And I just thought, man, if we're going to be the church, we got to make up our mind if we really believe what this book says or not. And if we believe it, then we need to get the Word of God in our hearts so that it's in our mouth so we start speaking it to people and we can meet them where they are and lift them up. And we don't worry what anybody else thinks about us being with somebody that's this way or that way. Because we know our heart is pure and we're just reaching to them like Jesus would. He wants our hands extended to be His hands extended. We are his body in the earth. So that means when we touch someone, we're touching them with the love of Christ. When we hug someone, we're, we're loving them on behalf of Jesus Christ. And if we name the name of Christ, then we don't need to be rejecting folks because of whatever it is that the devil's done to them to make them a little crazy. We need to remember that we were once a little crazy ourselves. And um, so, you know, it's important that we, that we cry out and ask God to help us to see people the way that he does. James 2.13 says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Every time, mercy. And that, that God is a merciful God. He's filled with love and compassion. And he wants us to be like him. There was a young girl... A number of years ago, I went with Joyce Meyer to speak at Lakewood Church. It's probably been about 10 years ago. And one of the staff at Lakewood had a niece that was in the psychiatric ward and for juveniles, and she was getting ready to turn 18, but she was 17. And she was on heavy medication, and she had, they said she had been diagnosed with multiple personalities and that she was just a mess. And Mary, you know, the county director there, she just says, I know that Jesus can change your life. And she said, would you go with me to see her while you're in town? Because they're getting re they've told her there's no hope for her. She'll be in mental institution the rest of her life, and there's nothing we can do. And they're getting ready to transfer her to a long-term facility as soon as she turns 18. So I said, yes, we'll go. So we prayed and believed. We went in. And her mother was Catholic, and nothing wrong with being Catholic at all. There's a lot of, some of the people that I know that love the Lord with all their heart, they're Catholic. But her mother was one of those Catholics that really didn't appreciate anybody else that wasn't Catholic. And she wasn't sure if she wanted me to go in there or not. So she interviewed me over dinner before she let me go to see her daughter. So I just told her a story about another girl whose brother was an NFL football player and they had spent $500,000 just because they had it to try to get help for their daughter and I just told her Tanya's story. I said, you know, she was told all the same stuff. And she, she had cut herself. She had tried suicide like 12 or 13 times. And she had big old scar on her and all this stuff. So depressed. And they said she would never, ever be able to function normally. And as a last-ditch attempt, they, she came. And, and we literally had to assign somebody to be with her 24-7 for a few weeks because she was so depressed and we, were, we didn't were concerned about her. She was on suicide watch. But we begin to feed the Word of God. If somebody's a baby, you know, when people are in critical condition and they can't eat, they put them on, uh, you know, they put them on something that supplies that food, the feeding tube. Well, basically, we were giving her a spiritual feeding tube, you know. And putting the word on the inside of her. And she was, come, and it was a, it took, a, the average length of stay at Mercy is six months. But this girl, it took a little bit over a year because she was so bad. But do you know that fast forward uh, about 12, 13 years. Today she and her, uh, she met, she went to work for, she worked for us for a while. But she was told she'd never be able to get a degree, be on medica heavy medications the rest of her life. 
she went and not only she got off all medication, she went and got her counseling degree, then she decided to get her master's degree, then she came to work for us as a counselor in the same program that she got freed at, and then after a few years, then she went to work for Joyce Meyer Ministries, and she's on full-time staff with Joyce Meyer today. That's where she met her husband, and they're happily married and just doing great. So I told this Catholic mom Tanya's story. And by the time I got through, she said, I think it'll be okay for you to go. I said, okay, good. Thank you. So I went, and I went in there, and the first thing I said to her was, you don't have to stay this way, and you don't have to believe anything you've heard. And I noticed this one nurse was hanging real close. I figured I was going to get in trouble, but I'm like, I just got one shot. I got to just load the gun and go for it. So I told her. And I found out later that that lady was planted in there by the Spirit of God. And she is in there every day as an intercessor and uh, referring people to people like us. And so anyway, I told the girl, you don't have to be like this. And she just, she was, her eyes were all dilated that had her so drugged up. And I said, and I, I just said, give me your hand. And I said, Lord, I'm, help me to get through to the Spirit in her and not all this that I can break through and talk to her and not this medication. And I just quickly told her, you know, you don't have to be like this. You can, you can have a new life. God says you have a choice. I told her all the things that I've set before you, life and death, blessing, cursing, you can choose. And if you'll ask Jesus, he'll forgive you and he'll help you overcome whatever it is that's hurting you. I said, he loves you so much. And I remember she got this contorted look on her face and she was angry and she looked at me and she goes, if God loves me so much, why did he let me get molested when I was seven years old? And I just said, you know what? I'm so glad you asked me that. And I said, let me tell you something. It, it was not the will of God that you got molested when you were seven years old. Because that's not what that God's word says not to do those kind of things. But Satan uses people who are not committed to God to work through to hurt innocent people. And you got hurt. And I said, honestly, God is as angry as you are. God is more angry than, than, than you are that that happened to you. And that's why he sent Jesus. And he actually sent me here today to speak freedom to you. Because he don't want you to be locked up for the rest of your life. And I don't have time to tell you the whole story. But I'll tell you the end of it. She came to mercy And she got, by the time she graduated, in six months, she was completely off of all psychotropic drugs. She left us and went to a two-year Bible school, graduated Bible school, and went on staff at Lakewood Church, where she is to this day. And she met a young man who's on fire for God at Lakewood about four years ago and got married. And last year, they had their first child together. And they are monthly partners with us. So... But that's what the love of God will do. And that's what telling the truth will do. And as I close, I just want to tell you that 1 Corinthians 1, 19, it says this. It is written. God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. And they scratch their heads, those secular guys. They cannot figure out. One eating disorder expert made an appointment with us. I think he's like Buddhist or something. He made an appointment and he was scratching his head and he goes, I've had several patients come back to see me after they've been through this program and I want to know what you guys are doing out here. And we tried to explain it, but his natural, unsaved, unredeemed mind couldn't get it. But he just like, "Uh, whatever y'all are doing, it's good. And he left. So, but praise God. But anyway, it's good. And we're going to have it right here. And we're going to see the devil get his butt kicked all over the place. And the girls are going to get free, and they're going to go out and help other people get free. Amen. Thank you. Oh, oh, that's right. I forgot. Thank you. Awesome. You can tell you touched a chord here in the right way. And uh, we are moved by your heart for people, and it's God's heart for people. And I think one of the things that strikes me is how important it is that we as a church have the heart that you talked about when people that are hurting come here. Sometimes hurting people have walked into church and not been loved. You've seen that happen too. How can we grow in that so that we don't uh, make quick judgments of people and 
and uh, treat them in the way that we shouldn't. You know, one of the most amazing things is, you know, time is something that's a precious commodity. And it's amazing how God can use, use it if you just stop while you're rushing to your class or wherever or because you want to get the, a seat closer to the front or whatever. It's amazing how God will use it if you just stop and take the time to speak to someone and ask them about themselves and have you been here before and, you know, well, welcome and what's your name and, you know, even be a connector where, you know, if you're 60 years old and that person is 18, grab one of the turned on 18 year olds and just say, hey, would you, I want you to meet, she's never been here before. You know, it's so easy to do that. And let, let people see that we really care about them, and that's one way. And then, just like I said, praying that, that the Lord will open our eyes and help us see people the way he does and remember that if somebody is not just like us, don't be offended by their sin and don't be offended that they're different from you because, they're, remember, there are many members but one body, and they're all different parts with different functions, and we all need each other. And a lot of times I think it's our own insecurity that causes us not to reach out to people who are different from us. So we need to be secure in Christ and just let the love flow out. It could be also people here who know someone that has a need that would be helped by your ministry, maybe even a family member. What would be the steps to take to uh, check out getting connected to the care that you give? We have a, a, a website, mercyministries.com, and there's information in the the magazine you'll get when you leave today, resources at the table. But basically, there's a you can download an application, or you can and you can feel free to call the number if you have questions. But we have a full intake department uh, that's fully staffed, and they take we take calls around the clock. So, uh, and if we're out, we'll call you back. But you know, we that's how we do it. And what we're looking for is a willing heart. We need someone who's willing to come in and have some some discipline and structure while the love is flowing and the healing is working and be willing to just deal with the hard issues. And if there's anybody in the service today, seven girls in here that would be happy to share, I'm sure, so uh, what what's they're going through. But but um, that's, that's the best way, yeah. really. And you take everyone in for free, but it costs a lot to care for them. So you have people who help support churches and individuals. So that's something we want to do as well. Anything about that that uh, would be helpful for us to know? Well, the thing that's probably the best thing I could share with you is that the Good Samaritan that did come by and pick up the guy that was bleeding and dying and in the ditch, he took him to a place. He took him to an inn, and he told the innkeeper, I'll pay the bill, and I'm, go I'll be I'm going away, but when I come back, if he needs anything else, take care of it, and I'll, I'll pay. And we see, I see that as our partners. They make a way that we can take spiritually dying people, bleeding in critical condition that may not live if they don't get help, and we can take them in. And, and so we have people, businesses, churches that put us in their mission bu budgets, uh, month, monthly uh, people that are willing to give monthly whatever amount they can. It's that regular monthly support that really helps us. And even right now, we have about 100 full-time staff in America, and we have to believe God for payroll every two weeks. I don't sweat it like I used to because I've learned that God's faithful. But, but it's just amazing. Like it's just, it always comes from somewhere. But, it, but it's in order to open a new home, we've got to build that partner base so that we have regular givers every month. So Good. Well, we want to join you in kicking the devil's butt. So that would be a good thing to do. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say that here publicly, so <laughs> it's a new thing. I kind of liked it. I think I might repeat it a few times. We're going to start a new ministry, butt-kicking ministry. For <laughs> Just got to target the right butt, so it's all right. Before we go, I want to do two things. One is to receive an offering, and uh, if we could have our musicians come and help us with that. And we want to contribute to what's going on and helping hurting people. I know that you're moved in your heart as I am by what we've heard. And so if, as we have the ability, the opportunity is before us, we should do what we can. If you write a check, you can make it out to the church. Uh, we, would, we will definitely turn 100% of it around in order to meet the need of Mercy Ministry. 
And it's also possible there could be a philanthropist in the house. You have ability, you have means to help in significant ways. We wouldn't have anyone here that we don't believe in with all of our heart and know the integrity of the person and of the ministry. So if you give something to this today, you can do so confidently that it is the right thing and a good thing, and you'd be blessed by it. If you have the means to partner in a significant way ongoing, I would just want to say to you, this is the right place to do it, the right kind of ministry to, uh, to bless in that way and leave a legacy of love. So as we give, let's keep that in mind. And uh, all of us, no matter what we have, can do something. And I just want to encourage you to do what you feel like you can. And we'll just do it together. The second thing I want to do before you go is just speak a blessing over you. So uh, that'll come right at the close of our offering. won't take long. So hold in there with us for the offering and then to receive a word of blessing from the Lord as we go today. Father God, we give you praise for your goodness to us. We thank you for Nancy and the Ministry of Mercy Ministries, the ladies' lives that have been touched hundreds, thousands already. We pray that it be multiplied many times over and that this place here in our city will be completed and open to touch many people right here in our own community. We believe for that, for all the provisions. We pray your blessing over our offering right now and what we can do. Use it and multiply it in Jesus' name. Amen.
He's crucified to set us free, and now we live to bring him praise. Let's do that in all we do. Why don't we stand together and just receive this blessing from the Lord's word today. Be blessed with God's supernatural wisdom and clear direction for life. The connection we have with him, he wants to just pour his wisdom into us. Be blessed with creativity, with courage, with ability and abundance. Be blessed with self-control and self-discipline. That doesn't come naturally by our flesh. It's out of control. God wants to give us the ability to get in control. He will as we depend on him. Be blessed with a great family, good friends, and good health. Be blessed with faith, favor, and fulfillment. Be blessed with success, supernatural strength, promotion, and divine protection. Be blessed with an obedient heart and a positive outlook on life. Be blessed in the city and in the country when you come in and when you go out. Any negative word that has ever been spoken over you is broken right now. That's not God. That's the enemy. And we break every negative word in Jesus' name. Everything you put your hand to will prosper and succeed. So be blessed in Jesus' name. Let's go in his grace and goodness. Bless somebody this week. Love them with his love as we receive it. We're going to give it out. God bless you for being here today. Stop by at the table in the back, too. Some of the Mercy Ministries information. Pick that up. Have a great week.